Thank you, everyone. In the metaverse and Web3, it really is a new digital world out there, one that can be terribly intimidating. In fact, we tend to use the term metaverse and Web3 interchangeably, but they're not the same. So I thought we'd start by defining what they are and what the difference is. And perhaps, Meghna, since you come from the company called Meta, you should tell us what the metaverse means, and then our resident digital disruptor can tell us about Web 3.0. Sure. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. I complete one year at Meta. We call it Metaversary. metaversary. <laughs> so I'm celebrating my Metaversary. Um, so to give, give this a shot, I think, go back to like 1995, which is when the internet started appearing in our lives. Some of us were in school, some were not even born. And uh, we felt like, you know, what is this thing? Some fad, God knows what it is. And today, it's absolutely inter integral to everything we do. We cannot imagine a world without it. I think you can confidently walk out of here and say, 10 years down the line, back in the same room, we will all be experiencing the metaverse very much as a part of our lives. So it's definitely a huge technology disruption, like the next big thing. Now, a couple of things to remember. Uh, numbers, it's about a $3 trillion economic opportunity that's going to emerge. But having said that, it's all not coming back to meta, because the metaverse is an ecosystem. So it has your developers, the technologists. You have platforms like meta. You have the creators who will actually use these platforms, and I'm sure Malini will touch upon it, to bring it alive. And brands like yourselves in the room to be able to work with creators, use these platforms, and like unleash this, this whole ecosystem to make it, make it work for you. The second thing I'd like to say is that to really simplify this down, or dumb it down, as I think Richard was saying, think of it as three steps. Metaverse, there's augmented reality, which is, let's call it phase one, which is just the world around us becomes like a 3D canvas. Yeah, you have lots of filters and those kind of things which exist. The second, on the other end, is virtual reality. Very popular in the world of gaming, but now becoming much more mainstream and many different ways to experience it. And in between is what we call mixed reality. So you have these kind of magical experiences, but they can happen in front of you. So I think as brands, as we experience this, try and look at it as these three blocks, and technology will keep evolving and enhancing. Great, I think uh, I finally understand what the metaverse is. Now maybe Malini can explain what the Web3 is. Oh, well, thank you so much. Okay, so I was thinking about how to do this. So I'll tell you what they say is the simple explanation, okay, for Web3, which is hilarious, because it's blockchain technology, decentralized, autonomous, organized, powered by cryptocurrency and NFTs, and this means nothing to anyone. So I'm gonna simplify it for you. The best way to understand Web3 is to take it back to Web1 and Web2. Web1 were read-only websites, which was basically the information economy. Web 2 is when social media came along and you had read-write. So you could put up pictures, you could do social media, you could connect peer-to-peer. -peer. Web 3 is read-write and own. And the reason why Web 3 is so exciting now is because people have realized that in uh, Web 2, there are a couple of problems. There are a couple of big players who kind of own everything and they own all your content. So in Web 3, the simple but complicated description is that it's the internet owned by the users. So I'll give you a really simple real life case scenario. For right now, suppose you're playing a video game and you've spent lots of money on it. If the makers of the game decide to shut it down, all the money you spent on Candy Crush piggy banks is gone with it, right? However, in Web3, anything you own becomes an NFT, a non-fungible token. So you continue to own it. So sometime in the future, you might have a Netflix subscription you don't have to cancel it, you can sell it to someone else because you own it forever. And now there are the front end, which is sort of the immersive virtual front end of Web3, which is the metaverse, where you can go and have a virtual avatar and you can trade in all of these goods and you can have your shops and that's where all of this is going to live. And what's really exciting about Web3 is that there are sort of 
real universes and lands there now. So there's Sandbox and what was Second Life. And so for instance, Snoop Dogg has his parties or Paris Hilton have their parties. So it's a limited amount of land that you can own, but it's decentralized, which basically means that no one person controls that economy anymore. So I hope that made it a little easier. I, th I think we've all got finally understood it. That was in terms we can all understand. Um, so when it comes to this world, because it is a work in progress and because it's something we don't understand, there can be lots of glitches in it. And, um, but it's very important when it comes to future pr proofing. Uh, Mr. Buck, maybe you can tell us, should brands be worried about glitches and is it vital to be a part of this new digital world for future proofing? So, uh, I, I come from a group which is a group in a brand which is 154 years of age. So, I guess I can say safely that we were born in the pre digital world and certainly in the pre Web3 world. Uh, but having said that, yes, I think it's extremely important for brands, including the brands as um, you know, old as the Tata brand, to be present where consumers are, to be present where the ecosystem is. And clearly, the world is going the digital way. And the world is going the Web3 and Metaverse way. So should brands experiment? Of course we should experiment. Of course we should be there, notwithstanding any glitches that may come up during the early stages of experimentation. Just to, just to give you one example, if you don't mind. Um, I, I used to, for many, many years, I used to work with the, the jewelry brand of the Tata Group, Tanishq. Uh, I no longer work with them now. I'm uh, handling the Tata brand. But very recently, I think just as of a, maybe a few months ago, uh, Tanishk launched a new collection called the Romance of Polki. Beautiful collection. I think it came, I mean, the unpolished gems stood out beautifully. And they wanted to launch this collection. And they could have launched it in a hall like this. Or they could la have launched it on television. But I think uh, the current management of Tanishk, their CEO and CMO, took a bold call that for a collection which is as fabulous as this, we are going to launch it in Metaverse. And I believe that you know, they got everyone who had to attend the launch, whether it was media, whether it was consumers, were called into the Metaverse. They created avatars for each of them to come and attend the launch of, uh, of uh, Romance of Polki. They actually created avatars of the jewelry. Um, and uh, I was amazed to see how beautiful the avatars of the jewelry looked, including the Polki, which was shining. They experimented and found that actually within the metaverse, a uh, night setting ensures that the diamonds come to life much better and the unpolished stones come to life much better. So experimentation is not just about metaverse, but about every element of metaverse. And I'm told at the end of the day that launch in metaverse was one of the finest launches that Tanishk has ever had. So I think even a brand like Tanishk, which was firmly born in the terraverse, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, now <laughs> is clearly trying it out in the metaverse, and I many other Tata brands as I well. believe they called it the Vivaverse, didn't they? Because the, yeah. that was the name of that brand that they were launching then. Um, so, they say that we're going to spend as much as five hours a day within the next couple of years on the metaverse. Um, Lulu, you are not only a brand evangelist, but you're a mum. So, I want to ask you, are Indian consumers really spending that much time, especially the young ones, on the metaverse? And do you see them spending five hours a day soon? I've seen figure. all of those reports as well. Why don't we start in this room? So raise your hand if in the last couple of months you visited a brand in the metaverse. Okay, we have 10, 10 hands maybe. So you got a little bit of an answer there. No Gen Zers here. But let me ask a couple more questions before we get to my daughters. How many of you have bought crypto? Ooh, okay. A few more. That's super interesting. And anybody here owns any kind of NFT? Okay, just a few. All right, there you go. I think this is a good pulse of where we are. But coming to your question, Sajata, my daughters are 15 and 14. <clears throat> In COVID, three years ago, 
all of their friends were on Roblox and Fortnite. It's just disappeared today. It's Instagram, Snap, Be Real. Okay. It doesn't mean that it's not coming. It's accelerated uh, behaviors which we're seeing globally. If you look at that report uh, from Wonderman Thompson into the metaverse, by the way, all brands should look at this report. Very, very comprehensive in terms of consumer attitudes towards all of these different technologies. The amount of time we are going to spend in the future is real. I think the, the key is going to be that unlock moment. We all know that the transformative power of the metaverse is there for brands, but for consumers to really join in, what's that unlock moment going to be? I don't think it's happened as yet in India for Gen Z. It's certainly happening around the world. So I don't, if anybody can guess, Nike, what is their revenue from the metaverse? Any guesses? $187 million. So clearly they've unlocked something. So whether it's Nike land and the merchandise that they're selling there, or Artifact, all of the different collabs that they're doing. Gen Z, I think, in the US, uh, in Korea, some in China, there the unlock moments have happened on gaming platforms and entertainment. I read that Ariana Grande's last concert had one million people. Now that's a physical barrier that you can't transcend. Uh, it's a barrier you can't transcend physically. When those kind of uh, applications, I think, come to the fore, there'll be a huge unlock. It's just going to take that one tipping point and they're all going to be there. By the way, I heard Dilair Mendy is the first one who owns Bale Bale Land, so please prepare oh, wow. yourself. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one, yes. Um, Mega, you touched on um, AR and VR, um, and I think that really does seem to be an inflection point in the luxury industry. How has this aspect of the medium um, effect, affected consumer behavior? So I think just like adding to some of the stats Lulu was saying, there are about 700 million consumers who have used AR filters. Not India, this is a, a global right. stat, so India included. And about 80% of them use it every month. So it's extremely engaging as a medium. So if you go back to like our marketing principles of how we look at using these things, so be it discovery, which is driving awareness, to evaluation, which is you know, making comparative choices, to finally action, you know, go do something about it. At every stage, different brands have tried very interesting stuff. Uh, so one very relevant example for this audience was the LVMH group. They launched um, a sneaker, Fendi Faster. You can search for it, you'll find the, find the example. Very fabulous AR rendition. Yeah, so th it's this beautiful shoe. It had a Roman aesthetic and vibe, and you could play with the filter, and you know, it chips away and the shoe appears. This was used for the brand launch. Now this experience, like what Lulu was also mentioning, how do you create it for millions of consumers at the same time across the world? And I think AR gave you that power to do it so effectively. And they also found that the cost of driving awareness was 60% lower than any other way of doing it in an impactful way. The second one in the evaluation space is um, some beautiful examples from the makeup industry where using AR filters, so Gigi Hadid ran this, we ran, one of the brands ran the campaign with her with like 30 shades of lipstick and you could just transform and see how the shade matches happen and translate that onto your own images to actually be able to help you make that choice. So you didn't need to go to a store and try it on. It perfectly checks on your skin tone and make that choice to be able to just close loop into a purchase. And finally, I think in the furniture space, using the same imagery to place these furniture images back into your ho own homes. So a lot of brands in Korea actually have done this very, very recently. So you can imagine that beautiful piece of furniture sitting exactly in your own home, place it at different spots, and decide whether it works or not. So I think these are things that you can't even imagine in the real world. Like how can you imagine a piece of furniture in your home standing in a store? So I think these are some real examples of some things that folks in this audience, you can take away and start thinking about. 
And I think there is the what and the how, which is also very important. While these are all very cool examples, I think as brand marketers, to think about what is it I want to do with this. Yeah, this evaluation, discovery, awareness. And don't fall into the trap of just gimmickiness. And at the same time, stay patient because it's technology, it's evolving. Nothing can turn around a brief in like three days time or three weeks time. Invest in it because otherwise you'll be fighting that battle. And I see it often. Hey, you know what, this doesn't look so beautiful. But why did you give it the three months? The Fendi faster one was I think about three, four months of time invested and it's beautiful. And I think the last thing I'd like to say is that there are moonshots and these are all sitting in the space of moonshots in our minds because we haven't played with those medium. But I think leading brands and leading experiences, you'll probably have to embrace it and kind of go out and try it. I think these are great examples for the metaverse. Uh, the Web3, I feel, is even more of a work in pro progress and in fact more glitches that happen in the Web3 than the metaverse. Um, so I'm wondering, should we actually be talking about Web 2.5 or digital approaches uh, when it comes to Web 3.0? Because the great thing about Web 2.5 is it's a great way to start your journey because you don't, there are less, less you know, it's, it has less friction and you perhaps don't need to have a crypto wallet. And also I think it's a great way for brands to educate the consumer about Web 3.0. Do you think brands need to think take that role to be the educator and do things like NFTs with a, like as a gift with purchase or something. I know, I know you're a great believer in no, that. No, I think so. I absolutely do. And I think I love this, your, you know, the, the, the phrase fidgetal, you know, you're just 2.5 before everyone really gets into it. Because, you know, you have, when you make a crypto wallet, I don't know how many people have a wallet here, how complicated it is to know your seed phrase, you have to like, and the thing is that if you lose your seed phrase for your crypto wallet, even MetaMask can't help you. you it's gone. Whatever money's in that wallet is gone forever. Because oh they're trying to save, guard you so well that they don't know how to get in either. So, you know, if you have a bad memory, like I've written my, it's in my locker, it's in my safe, it's like in multiple places. So, so it, it is complicated for people, but I think what's really smart, the 2.5, is you have to baby step everything in, right? So I was part of Web 1 when, you know, MTV India was like a website and we had the boom and the bust and everyone shut down because they didn't know what to do with it until social media came along and, you know, we used to hook that together, in fact. And I realized that this wave that's going and coming right now, it's about People don't understand, okay, you spend so much money on these board apes, what does it do, why, is, why, why are we spending so much money on it? But there is a huge opportunity for brands in this space and it's very clever for brands to ease people into it. And I think the real key will be building your communities because there are three types of community, right? Your community, uh, your, your product is either your community or your community is buying or building your product. And I think it's very important to introduce them to this. And there's some really simple, fun examples. I went to a fashion show with Priya Kataria Puri, who she made NFTs of all her guests who came. And you open your wallet. So it kind of makes it simpler because otherwise you feel like, okay, well, I open a wallet. Now I'm, and you know, I'm a digital person, but I found it quite difficult even myself when I went through the process. So you just have to simplify it for people. And the token economy is what you're trying to get people interested in. The idea that this token that I'm now giving you with your purchase is going to be of value in some way or shape or form in the future, right? It could be Justin Bieber sold an NFT and then you can get first dibs on his tickets or the first release to any brand launch that you're doing or special access or the full video when it comes to content. So I think it's really important to introduce people to it, to it and I think the most important thing is simplify your language when you're explaining something to your audience just like I try to do here because then it's less intimidating. Yeah. I just want to add I think 2.5 is also important because <clears throat> the hardware, excuse me, the hardware is still clunky, expensive and until that form factor gets better, we're not going to actually see the full potential of the metaverse. So even now, those of many of the brands that talk about the metaverse, it's just a souped up browser experience. It's mm -hmm. not really right. on the headset. <clears throat> Apple's going to come, come out with something in the summer. I think when we see Apple's play, that might accelerate behaviors. Uh, or if somebody else, I think, very, very radically innovates with the hardware, things might change rapidly as well. And 2.5, I think, is a nice interim till we get to a place where technology is much easier. Everyone's very excited about Web3 in community building. That's what it, I think it really is for brands. And um, I think it's the core of every marketer's job. So 
Malini, perhaps you can tell us this since content is your thing. Honestly, I think communities are the future for all brands, whether you're virtual, physical, whatever it is, because I think that's where you really build brand loyalty, right? There's so many um, talks about this, that all you need is 1,000 loyal customers to have a brand, and then you sort of escalate up from that. And what's interesting about the metaverse in Web3 is that there's a lot of subcultures that are coming to life. Like, especially in India, you know what's a huge community? Gardening. Sneakerheads. So these are the communities that are becoming really strong at the forefront. And I think that's what's really key. And they're the ones that are creating a lot of conversation. So one step in the right direction you can take as a brand is introduce yourself to platforms like Discourse. So NFTs really introduce themselves by, you know, when they launched an NFT, they would start a Discourse. I don't know if you guys use Slack at work in some places. So basically you create channels of conversation where you can have different topics and people come and join it. And it's a much more immersive conversation. It really feels like a real life community experience. So these are the things that you start doing. And I think community is the future for all brands in every way because your community also then becomes a captive audience. If you look at social media today, you might get lost in the algorithm. But if your community member is coming back to you on a regular basis, they're not going to miss what you have to offer. I think uh, just on community, if you have a community already and want to get started, there's Mighty Networks. Check out Mighty Networks, straight onto Web3 and all of the things. In fact, the case studies of Mighty Networks are pretty impressive in terms of how engaged the community members are. There's this woman uh, who, does, uh, who started a yoga community uh, on Mighty Networks and the level of engagement, the kind of merchandise, the kind of uh, you know, sort of follow-up program she's been able to upsell through that platform is really impressive because it's uh, incorporating a lot of Web3 technology. Um, perhaps um, each of us, could you could, I mean, I think you've given us great actionable advice, but I think people are still skeptical. So maybe each one of you could give us one piece of advice that we can all take away to get us started on our new digital world journey. So I think just going back, go try out AR for your brand. You can do it right away. My piece of advice is don't get intimidated by all the crash and burn that you saw in the last two years of NFTs. It's all a work in progress. Be fresh with your approach. Give it a shot and read and listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm going to steal something that Gary Vervchuk said uh, at Cannes in 2023. I attended a panel discussion by him on NFTs with Paris Hilton. Hilton and he said, you can't do push-ups by reading about how to do them or watching them. <laughs> you have to do it. So he said, go and spend 10,000 hours learning about Web3 and the metaverse. Open, uh, you know, uh, build your avatar, open an account on crypto, do it. Learn by doing would be the biggest guidance. Lulu, do you have an avatar? Sorry, yes, do I do, do actually. Okay. I'm, I, am, I am experimenting. I'm You're not yet ready to come out with it, but I'm still playing around. So my piece of advice is somewhat in the same area that Lulu mentioned. Whichever space you're in, whatever category, whatever brand, go out there and keep experimenting. Don't worry about how successful you are going to be with every experiment, but keep experimenting in the digital space, keep experimenting in metaverse, keep experimenting with each of these areas of Web 2.5 or Web 3.0. And as some of the speakers said, I think it's an evolving field. As you experiment, you get to know them. Uh, so keep experimenting all the time. That's my advice. And I think next time this panel, our avatars will be doing the talking. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that'll <laughs> be true. interesting. I, I think it would have been really nice if it actually brought the headsets and we could have all like played with it. So next Jata, time. like I always tell you, it's possible we're already in the matrix and these are just really evolved <laughs> avatars. <laughs> yeah, this, this all is just not really happening, right? It's just happening in, the, in, in an alternative universe. I think we could talk about this subject on and on, and I know that there are drinks coming up next, so I suggest you catch each one of them over a drink, and you get them to explain more about this subject, because... I would with... have your parting advice for everyone, too, Sajjad. Oh, me, I listen to podcasts, actually. I still haven't, I still haven't really got myself around, around to it, but I do listen to a lot of podcasts, and I think that's, that's very important to do, and I read a lot about it. But I'm, I'm, I know I need to get there. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.